Well, I'm pleased to be joined by my next guest. He's a VCU alum, 32-year-old, one-time, so far, one-time PGA Tour winner, 2019 Houston Open, Lanto Griffin. Lanto, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, thanks. Well, great having you on. Hey, I wanted to ask you, so here we are in this stretch. It's already the West Coast swing. You're coming off a, a top 10, a tie for seven at Torrey Pines. How much confidence do you take from playing that well on a tough golf course? Uh, I take a lot more confidence from that than I did the week before at American Express where I missed a cut. It was, um, you know, that kind of motivated me to, I love Torrey Pines to begin with. It's one of the most beautiful golf courses on earth. It's extremely challenging and, and uh, the U.S. Open is going to be there this June. So that was one of the tournaments that I kind of marked on my, my schedule that, you know, I really wanted to play well at and, and, and get some good feels going into the summer. And, and I was able to do that. So I had a, I had some good pairings this week. I got to play with Victor Hovland, you know, three of the four days. Played with Tony Finau and and uh, John Rahm on Sunday. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun playing with Victor. Uh, was great. The kid's hilarious, incredible player, and and uh, so it was just all around really fun week. You talk about pairings. Like, how much of an effect does that have on your mental game or on on the way you play um, during a round? It. it, it it depends when you, when you get in a group with where you, you get along well with the guys and you're talking and you're playing well and it, golf seems pretty easy. And then some days you'll get with the guy that's in a bad mood and he's slamming clubs and, you know, has a really bad attitude. And it, it just kind of brings the whole group down. Uh, if you're playing well, it doesn't really matter. But sometimes when you're kind of on the fence and, and, and you have that comfortability and you have that camaraderie, sometimes it can kind of, take you to the next level and and, uh, and that's kind of what happened this week so it, it some weeks it matters some weeks it, it doesn't and uh, you know this week it was it was a lot of fun yeah hey one thing I noticed uh, off air real quick can you turn your camera to the side so it's more of a pano look yes uh, that way yeah that that way we can see a little bit more of you yeah um, well definitely I, that makes a lot of sense um, Lonto I was curious as we look back so far where you at where you're at in your season right now, you played your first Masters just two and a half months ago. What were the takeaways from that week? I know it was a long time coming for you. Yeah, the takeaways were uh, started the week extremely excited and kind of ended it a little bit bummed. You know, it was uh, it, Augusta didn't um, let let down at all. I mean, it was an incredible experience being there inside the ropes and. And, and walk in the hallowed ground. So looking back on it, I, I don't really think about how much I, you know, how disappointed I was and how I played. I, I think back on, you know, the clubhouse and the and the tee shots off 11 and 13, and, you know, hitting the tee shot on 18, you know, the narrow shoot. And so I think back to all that stuff. I try not to think about how I played as, as much. Um, but going forward, I did take some positives away in the fact that, you know, my short game held up nice around there. I felt comfortable around the greens. Um, I just, I didn't, didn't hit it great that week. So uh, going into April this year, uh, having some patrons back and my family being able to be there, there will be a little bit of redemption and, uh, you know, that I'm going to be a little extra motivated. Not that you need much extra motivation for the masters, but I'll uh, have the first one under my, uh, under my belt and I'll, I'll have a little bit more experience this time. With speaking about having your family, do you know how many tickets you're going to be allotted to for this upcoming Masters? We haven't been told yet, but uh, I'm assuming since they're going to have a limited number of patrons that we're going to be able to at least have, you know, mom and, you know, we we're allowed to have our coaches and our girlfriend in uh, in November, but hopefully me and my mom and my sister and, and uh, some of those types of people can come. Definitely. Yeah. Well, here, one thing I, I want to ask you about, you, you mentioned your coach, um, Steve Pratter. What was it like having him? He's been such an instrumental part of your life, Lonto, for so long. But to have him there at your first Masters, what did that feel like? It was awesome. I mean, that's it was a kind of a once in a lifetime experience for both of us, because for me growing up in Virginia, the Masters was always kind of that first week where golf's back. You know, it was always the weather had always been real cold and, uh, you know, January, February, and, and then you get into March and it starts warming up. You have one or two days. And then kind of that first week in April when the Masters is when 
you know, everybody gets out and starts playing again. And, and that was kind of when me and Steve would get out, get, get from the nets indoor hitting to getting out in the range. And, and that's when, you know, that the, the Saturday, Sunday of Augusta week, I can remember as always play as many holes as you can in the morning and then go home and watch the masters. So being able to be there, um, there's no question Augusta nationals, the most sacred golf course in the world, in my opinion. Um, and the, the the most sacred tournament in the world. So being able to, you know, be there with the guy that helped me get there was kind of, you know, obviously a dream come true. And be, just being able to walk without anybody else there, uh, patron-wise, kind of made it even more surreal. It's just me, him, and, and my caddy, which was really cool. Well, speaking of playing a lot of golf as much as you can and then watching the Masters, you have some buddies there in, uh, is it Ponte Vedra Beach, right, where you live now? some guys that had done that with you and then they texted you right once you were actually there this past year they texted you tell us about that yeah yeah so we uh i have some they're actually was my best friend growing up and then one of our mutual friends in columbus ohio and uh, we started a kind of a master's trip about four years ago where they all came down to florida um and we'd go play golf at different golf courses and then we'd watch the masters in the afternoon and they would, they would always tell me like one day we're not gonna be able to do this because you'll be playing. And it was kind of a joke. I I mean, that's not going to happen. It's such a hard tournament to get into. So, well, you know, after I won Houston, you know, the Jason and Oliver, they both texted me like, we we told you, buddy, you know, this, this year is going to be different. You know, the, the, uh, you know, spring break 2020 is going to be a little bit different, which it ended up being different because of, of COVID and not, not the masters, but uh, again, in 2021, we're going to have to skip it. I'm sure we'll eventually we'll get back to our normal spring break routine, but uh, I'm glad to be able to pass on it one more year, 2021. Definitely. Well, anything in particular about this upcoming masters and the lead up to it that you're looking forward to? The fans. Yeah. The, pa- the patrons is, it's just not, the golf's not the same. Um, I think LeBron, Commented on the other night, he misses the fans uh, in the arena. Once you get a taste of what it's like playing in front of fans and having ovation ovations, and and uh, it's just it's just not the same. You know, like 13 at at Torrey Pines last week, uh, I hit a pretty good wedge shot in there on on Sunday, and I, I I couldn't tell if it was short or long, and and I kind of looked at my caddy, and I was like. You know, it's kind of weird not having fans. You know, if, if we had fans there, we'd be able to tell immediately, you know, when you have a blind shot, whether it's whether it's good or bad. And and uh, same thing happened to me in Kapalua on, on 16. I thought I I thought I stuffed a wedge in there, and even my girlfriend didn't clap. And I thought it was, you know, I thought it one hopped long or something, and I had 20 feet, and we get up there, and it's, you know, three or four feet, and we were joking with her. And and it's just different. I mean, it not only that, it's just the atmosphere and, and, uh, you know, seeing kids so excited when you give them a ball and, and, uh, you know, even seeing the drunk guys that are, you know, heckling you a little bit, we all kind of miss that too. So it's, uh, we won't see that as much at, at Augusta, but having that atmosphere, I think of all tournaments in the world, the fans make Augusta national, uh, special just because of the roars just because you can hear them, you know, if you, the leaderboards aren't like normal tour events, nobody has their phones out. So hearing roars is, is a good way to figure out what guys are doing ahead of you and behind you. So uh, we're all hoping that the fans get back to Augusta and, and we all get to experience that this, this April. Well, speaking of excitement and anticipation, you got, you were the first player to get to the golf course on one of those practice days. I think it was Tuesday morning, right? Tell us about that. Getting there at five or five thirty or something. Yeah. So the weather, from what I remember, the weather was going to turn bad about noon or one. And uh, I just played in Houston the week before and got in uh, Sunday night and we had to do the, the COVID testing. So I didn't feel overly prepared and, and with the weather coming in, Normally, you just get to the course and play nine holes at, you know, 7.30, 8 a.m., but at Augusta, you, you get there at 5.30, and then you get 18 holes in and realize that the uh, meteorologist was wrong, and, and it didn't rain until about 4 or 5 o'clock, so uh, it was all fun. It was all good, but it was it was cool being the, the first guy on the range, you know, Tuesday morning, hitting under the lights, and, and actually got to 10, 10 tee about 6.45, 
and uh, found out that the tee doesn't open till seven. So I uh, ended up waiting for 15 minutes and got the tee off first. So it was, uh, it's just a magical place, man. It's like breathing in caffeine, being around there. It's, it's hard to leave. You really don't want to, you, you really don't want to leave, uh, leave that place when you have a chance to be there. Gosh, well, breathing in caffeine, like, so, so what specific part of the place makes you feel that way? I just think the fact that how private it is and how hard it is to, you know, to get on there, it doesn't matter who you are in the world. It doesn't mean that they're going to accept you as a member and, and it's closed half the year. Um, you know, the, from a golf tournament standpoint, the masters is the smallest field in of all the majors and, and one of the hardest ones to get in. So once you get in it and you have the opportunity to play that it, it's, it's a big achievement and it's a, uh, you know, it's an honor to be there. And when they allow you to get in through the, the gates on Washington Road, you really don't want to take it for granted and you really don't want to leave. So it's just, uh, you know, we play golf tournaments every, you know, I, I play 30 to 35 tournaments a year. And, and there's only a select few tournaments that I've gotten to that just feel way bigger than anything else. And, and the Masters is definitely on the top of the list. Well, let me ask you this. A lot of the listeners that I have here, they're so interested in practice and how can we get better at putting? Because I know putting is something that you're very good at. You're in the top 20 in uh, strokes gain on putting. Um, what can we do better? When we get to the golf course, we got 15 minutes to warm up. What can we do better with our putting to be ready? Yeah, so for, for me, I have about three or four things I focus on all the time. One, speed control. Uh, speed control is the, the most important thing. If you don't, if you don't have an idea how hard you're going to hit the putt, you can't read it. And if you can't read it, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to hold it. So everybody always talks about your stroke, you know, how's my stroke look? Well, you know, the stroke really isn't that important. You know, obviously it is, but, um, if you can't control the speed, then you're going to be in trouble. Basically it's such a short, simple motion. So for me, I like to match tempo and rhythm. Tempo is the speed of the stroke and rhythm is how far back and how far through. So if you can, you know, in your head, if you can take it back with the same tempo and rhythm as your your forward stroke, that's gonna be able to make your speed control a lot more consistent. And the more consistent you can be with your speed control, uh, the easier it's gonna be able to read putts, especially at a course like Torrey, Pan Torrey Pines on Sunday. You know, there's so much slope around those greens. It's so hard to read. You know, you have a six-footer that could break a cup and a half. And I played with Phil Mickelson at uh, the Greenbrier two or three years, I think 2018. And he had a putt that was similar to that. It was about a 10-footer that, you know, maybe broke a cup. And he asked his caddy, Tim, he said, you know, Tim, he said, what's the least and the most amount of break I can, I can hit this and still make it? Because it was a downhill putt. And as soon as he said that, it made total sense to me. You know, there's not one line that you can hit to make a putt, depending on the speed, unless it's a dead straight putt, obviously. But it was one of those putts where he could play to, you know, half a cup to the right, or he could play it two and a half cups out and died in. He could either, you know, drill it in. And so ever since then, I think about that all the time. You know, I don't, I don't try and pick one line. I try and feel out what speed I want to hit the putt with. And then I try and pick a line that's going to match that speed. And um, another thing I would, I would tell people, I always tell my pro-am guys, um, is on longer putts, putts that you're not going to make, you always want to miss them on the high side. And the reason for that is if, if it goes by the hole on the high side and it goes three feet by, it's going to get closer to the hole as it goes by versus if, it, if you miss it on the low side and it goes three feet by, it's not going to go three feet by, it's going to go probably three and a half to four and a half feet. So that being said, you, you still want to give yourself a chance to make even a 30, 40, 50 footer, but you want it to be, you know, perfect speed drops in the high side and goes in so that if you miss it, if it comes up short, you know, you're all right. And if it goes by, then it's getting closer to the hole. So that, you know, if you can avoid one three putt, you know, per round, if you're a, if you're a 20 handicap and you're used to having three, three putts, if you can knock that down to two, three putts, then you can, you know, maybe make one or two more, you know, par putts or, you know, up and downs, that type of thing. You can, you can drop some scores. Um, go ahead. 
I was going to say, like, what are a couple drills that you do with your putting when you do practice? Because you only really yeah. practice Monday through Wednesday. What are some drills that are good? I start every day. I, every day before a tournament, I start the same way. I, I, have a, I do a one-handed drill with just my left hand. Um, for me, you know, my, my right hand is a dominant hand. Putting is such a finesse type of, you know, movement that I, I kind of want my lead hand, which is my left hand, to be in control. Now, Tiger's different. Everybody's Everybody has a different opinion on, on putting. And um, for me, I putt better with my left hands, you know, solely in motion. So I start out hitting probably 15 three-footers, three to four footers with just my left hand. I'll work all the way around, left to righters, straight, right to left, you know, downhill, uphill. I don't like to get out much, much outside five feet with just the left hand. I just want to get that left hand muscle memory activated in the morning. And then I'll have a, uh, I have a mirror that I use, you know, maybe once or twice a week just to make sure my eyes are, you know, just inside the ball and in, in, in the right spot. Um, and I do a, a, the above line string drill. Um, I think uh, Simple Stroke has one. And uh, my buddy Christian Heavens just started a, a training aid called Tour Line. Uh, it's a really popular on tour. You'll see guys all the time using them. It's just a string. Uh, connected to two posts and you it's basically a chalk line above above ground and uh, you can set your putter in underneath it make sure that it's lined up properly your eyes are directly over the ball so set up and and making sure that the fundamentals are right and then on after that I'm I'm all feel you know I, I, I try and feel my left hand I always have you know I might be trying to feel my lower body engaged to the ground I, I always I always try and tell people that Try and feel like your lower body is in concrete, so you don't want your hips opening or closing at all. In a stroke, it's almost like you want your lower body to be resisting your upper body. It's just going to make the stroke more more stable. Um, let me think. Uh, I like to use my core. Uh, when I pull the putter back, I want to feel like my, my left obliques are flexing, and then when I when I stroke through, my my right obliques are are, are flexing. For me, all it does is stabilize the putter face. Pretty much everything I do in putting is has to do with tempo and rhythm, matching my my stroke up, and then stabilizing the face. Um, so it sounds complicated, but it's pretty simple to me because um, i I tend to work I tend to work on the same things over and over and over. Even though I don't practice a ton of putting, you know, for the last ten or fifteen years, I've I've grooved in um, you know kind of the same drills and everything where in the rest of my game, driving irons and all that, I, I tend to be a little bit more like a chicken with his head cut off. I'm always trying, testing out new ideas. And, and uh, I joke around with my coach, uh, you know, that why can't my simplicity with my putting, you know, why can't we just add that into the long game? But it's, it's obviously a little bit different animal. And real quickly, because you're always uh, making adjustments for the longer game, how long is your pre-round routine? Does it fluctuate in terms of overall length? Uh, no, it's usually the exact same every day. I, I tend to get there. Lately, it's been different with COVID because, you know, some weeks we don't have locker room. We don't have dining. Uh, we have to eat outside. So lately, it's changed it's changed a bit. For the last couple of years before COVID, I'd get to the course two hours before every day. I'd, I'd warm up. I'd eat. I'd get to the range about 40 or 50 to 55 minutes before my tea time. And uh, I'd actually start with putting about 15 minutes. I go do short game, uh, you know, 10 minutes of that. And I, I usually have 25, 25 minutes to warm up on the range and I, I go to the tee. So I, I try not to get to before tournament rounds. It's mainly just, you just want to get some confidence. You just want to get a feel, get an idea of what you have for the day. Rarely do I ever work on anything technical um, before a tournament round. If I'm working on something technical before a round, it's, it's usually, you know, a red flag and, and not a good sign. But uh, save that stuff for for Monday to Wednesday. Yeah. Well, speaking of playing around of golf, it's winter time. There's so many people that don't want to play. They want to take I don't know four months off. W what is your perspective for us amateurs? Should we be playing during when it's really cold? What's what's your advice for us in the cold? You know what? It it, it depends on how much you love the game and and what your goals are. Uh, I play. We play a lot of pro ams, obviously, with with all types of golfers, from you know scratch golfers to Last week at Torrey, I played with a, a fireman that, you know, is, he's been playing golf for six months. 
and he had two iron sh- or he had two bunker shots to to a foot. He lipped out one and and uh, almost made the other one. And you know, now granted, his setup and his posture and everything like that was all wrong. He had some incredible hands. So everybody's talent level. I mean, granted, he probably still shot 140 or 150, but it, I was extremely impressed with him. So you know, it doesn't really matter where you're where you're at with your game, whether you started six months ago, six months ago, and you're 50 years old or I mean, you're 14. It's a, it's basically a matter of what you want to get out of the game. Uh, how good do you want to get? Do you want to enjoy, just enjoy golf and be the golfer you are? Do you want to, you know, become a scratch golfer, et cetera? So you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, how good do you want to be? Um, I have a lot of respect for the guys that, that are not good and they don't want to practice and they just want to go out and have a good time. And, they, you know, they play fast and they don't break clubs. And um, I can tell you that the guys that are, shooting 95 and slamming clubs shouldn't be slamming clubs that's for sure um but yeah just i would just say ask yourself how good do i want to be what are my goals and and then try and find a plan um you know sometimes it's it's cold outside it's still nice to get out and you know get away from work and stress of life and just go hit some balls there's always uh, I've, i've been seeing a lot of stuff on social media where indoor facilities where you can go you know they have a bars and couches and simulators and you know, TVs and stuff where you can go, you know, practice on your game. Sometimes in the wintertime, just hitting into a net's better because you're not attaching a, you know, result to your your golf swing and you can actually work on more of a technical side of your game. Uh, that's kind of what we did growing up back in Blacksburg is more just hitting into a net with, with my coach, uh, Steve Prater. So uh, everybody is different. I, I try not to put people into a mold, especially when I'm giving them advice because uh, everybody is so different. Definitely. Well, hey, as we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about, obviously, there's um, the future with the tour and the future with um, rules, and obviously the discussion at Torrey Pines. There was, there was um, I, I guess as I think about it, with what happened with Patrick Reed, what are kind of the bigger picture things that we take away with rules? Like, the, does a group need to have, does every single group on tour need to have an assigned, you know, rules person or like, it, what are we looking at going forward? I don't think so at all. Um, like I, I made a comment Sunday afterwards, that I think 99% of golfers are, you know, they have a conscience and, and golf such a game of sportsmanship and, and doing the right thing that, that I've never worried about. Well, I shouldn't say never. I've always, I've probably only played with two or three guys in my professional career that I've actually been worried about that might take advantage of the rules. Um, I've heard some people talk about, well, guys take advantage of the rules all the time, whether it be a cart path drop or a sprinkler head or, you know, fire ants or something like that. That's, that's part of the game. And I don't think any, any players really argue with that. But when you see guys purposely taking advantage of the rules that, you know, it's, it's frustrating. It's, I think all the golfers out there, uh, you know, weren't too happy with what happened, you know, this week at Torrey. Uh, going forward, you know, I don't think it's the player's position to get in. I mean, do you want us to go, you know, argue with a guy mid round? You know, this isn't, it's not a con- high contact sport. It's hard to, you know, there's a reason why a lot of golfers don't get too high and get too low is because you want to keep your adrenaline and you want to keep everything kind of even keel. Whereas in football, you want to get mad. You want to get angry. You want to be able to hit somebody, that type of deal. So it's hard to get in an arguing match or confrontation during a round. Um, It just makes things awkward. And, and um, so it's kind of hard to put the players, not that I wouldn't, you know, not that I wouldn't call somebody out if I saw them blatantly cheating, but I don't, I don't go out of my way to, you know, try and make things awkward. So I would like to see, you know, it's, it's tough. I, I wasn't there in the situation. I saw the, I saw the ball drop and I saw it, you know, obviously not plug on the, on the fly. So my opinion, I don't know if, I don't think it, it plugged and, and, um, but he called a rules official, the rules official went over and, and from the information that he had, he uh, you know received a drop and got up and down and won the tournament by by five shots. So um, majority of players aren't happy, um, and I think the the main resolution would be that the tour is going to have to somehow somehow crack down on them. And 
I have full confidence in the tour. They've done an incredible job um, with everything from scheduling through COVID to, you know, the purses going up and fan, you know, fan engagement, everything. So I think they'll find a way to, to make this right going forward. And, and hopefully we never have to have this uh, conversation again. Right. Well, you said that um, you're, you're sure that the tour will crack down on, on things like in what sense, like how can they, um, you know, do that essentially? Yeah, maybe not crack down, but maybe just find a resolution. Maybe just say, hey, look, um, I know Matthew Wolf last week, he got a penalty, I think, at American Express, or he had a penalty after the round. And, and you know, so you see some of these infractions where clearly um, it appears that there was a rules infraction and there wasn't a penalty. So, you know, it's, there has to be some kind of education or, or consequences to uh, some of these actions that, that we've seen blatantly on camera. So if the, if the tour, um, I think the tour will, they'll meet and they'll, you know, behind closed doors, they'll, they'll find a way to address it. And, and hopefully going forward, we don't, you know, that's one of the cool things about golf is that people generally don't try and take advantage of the rules like other, you know, nobody's going to call a foul on themselves in basketball or football or soccer. Um, I know I've, I've called a penalty on myself in a tournament action. I know, Tons and tons of other players that have done the same thing. So, um, ninety-nine percent of us out on tour understand, you know, kind of the morals and ethics of the game, and and kind of what the game means. It's it's bigger than, you know, trying to find any advantage to win. We do that already with equipment and practicing and and all that. When it comes to the rules of the game, you kind of have to respect it and and uh, do the right thing. Mm. Well. Um... Speaking of that, like trying to find that way to win, like what is the overall general sentiment? Like you said that, you know, people, players are not happy about what happened there with, with Reed. And I know, you know, Rory had a similar situation too, but like what, what is the general sentiment that what should have happened there or, or the thoughts there? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, first off, Patrick, if he, if he did, I, I don't know for sure if he, if, he cheated or if, or if it was plugged or what, because I wasn't there. So I'm not trying to, to judge him for, for what he did. I know he doesn't need to. And I know most players in a situation like that, you know, Patrick's an incredible player. I get along well with him. Um, you know, I respect his game a lot. I know most people, if there's, if there's a rule under question, whether or not I should um, get the drop, whether or not my ball crossed the water hazard here or I have to drop 200 yards back, majority of players will that they don't even want to the risk being considered you know you know what happened this last weekend they're just going to automatically just take the worst situation which sounds you know some of your listeners might say that i'm crazy for saying that but i'm really not uh last week at american express i snap hooked a driver on number five a par five and and it, it came close to crossing you know on a par five and I looked over at Scott Piercy and I was like, what do you think? And um, I wanted to get his feeling because sometimes when you hit a really bad shot, you kind of, you're pissed off. You look down, you look up, you didn't get an exact line. He's like, he's like, I don't know, man. I was like, all right, I'm just going to drop back here. You know, cause that kind of gave me, I know they were looking at it probably closer than I was. And um, the fact that he wasn't sold on it, basically just told me that I just need to drop, you know, 200 yards further back short of the water instead of, you know, over the, the corner where it could have crossed. And um, for me, it's more just being able to sleep at night and, and knowing that you didn't try and take advantage of the rules. And uh, obviously, um, you know, I ended up making par in the hole. I hit three wood up there and then hit a nine iron on and made a 30 footer for par. So, you know, if I go up there and, and I, and I feel like I'm taking advantage of the rules and, and I'm going to, it's going to be on my conscience. And, and uh, even though I got to hit from 150 yards further up, you know, that night I'm going to be, you know, I might be thinking, you know, was that the right, right thing to do? And uh, so most of the guys on the PJ tour, you know, that's how they feel. I see it all the time. Guys are like, you know, I'm not, I'm just going to drop back here. I don't know if it crossed or not. And the rules state you have to be 99, you know, virtually certain, you know, that it did cross in a certain area. If not, you have to go back. So, uh, it's the same rule with a plug lie or it's the same rule with, you know, ground your club in a bunker. If there's not video coverage of it and, and you're not sure if you did, you think you did, then then you did. 
So that's kind of the that's kind of the unwritten rule of of golf ethics on the PGA Tour. So most players want to see that. You know, the kind of the way they treat the rules, they kind of want everybody to do the same to, to create a playing a level playing field. When when guys don't and it's on camera and it's blatant, then uh, it's frustrating. Right. And so it, it, is that this overall sentiment that it's kind of on camera, that it's blatant, that if there was a, you know, a, a mis, I guess a mistake, for lack of a better word, that was done here at Bay Farmers? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get – the balls just don't plug in, in thick rough like that. They don't one hop and plug. I mean, it's just, it's hard to imagine that would happen. And there could have been a really soft, you know, little spot where it dropped into and I could be completely wrong because I wasn't there, but um, it, it leaves, a, it, it leaves your, your mind wandering how a ball could plug, you know, when it one hops and, and, um, you know, kind of the way that he picked the ball up and marked it was a little interesting as well. So, um, but like I said, Patrick Reed's a hell of a player. He deserves a lot of credit and, and I, I respect his game and, uh, and I get along well with him. So I don't want to, I don't want to sit here and, and question everything he does. I mean, he still won the tournament by five shots, but I would just, I guess my message would be you really don't need to take advantage of the rules because you're, you know, you're one of the best players in the world to begin with. Yeah. Does it have an effect like going forward? Like, do we, do we look, you know, I, are, are there any repercussions going forward? I mean, is it just, what's the thought there? I mean, uh, the public eye, I guess, um, your conscience. I mean, I think everybody wants to be liked and wants to be respected by their peers as little or as much as they say they do. Um, that's kind of, you know, it feels nice to be, have nice things said to you and and uh Patrick's a good guy I mean he's he's a, he's always been really nice to me when we played together and even going back to college golf so um as a person you know you're going to be judged by what fans see from you on tv and and um at least in our sport and and it's a little unfortunate that uh some of the on-course actions you know have happened the way they have but um We'll see what the tour does. It's, it's not up to the players. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing that we can do directly to him to, you know, to change anything. And um, I have full trust in the PGA Tour to, to, you know, do an investigation or maybe not even maybe not do anything. But you know, at the end of the day, um, we'll just have to, to live with whatever happens, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Well, where are we going to see you next on tour, Lanta? I am playing ninety uh, percent chance my next event will be Genesis. Uh, a part of me wants to play next week at Pebble. I just love I love Pebble Beach, but my body needs a break. So it'll probably be Genesis, WGC at Concession, uh, Bay Hill, and and the players. So I'll play I'll play four in a row starting at uh, Riviera. So I love Riviera. Um, it was such a fun tournament last year, and then being able to finish a four in four week road trip with the, the players is uh last year we only got to play one round and uh I live in I live and play right here at, in uh, Jacksonville Beach Ponte Vedra area so I I can't wait to to be able to hopefully play four days at, at TPC this time great stuff man well hey always great catching up with you Lanto and I, I hope the best to you this uh, season in the lead up to the players and, and also the Masters awesome thanks Garrett appreciate it